Welcome to First Time for Everything, a podcast for curious people. I'm your host, Danny Elliott. I've toured the world as a backing vocalist for some of the biggest names in music, owned a prop rental business, ran a vintage boutique out of a camper I renovated, and have had a lot of firsts in my life. I created this podcast in hopes of inspiring you to take a chance on something you've been wanting to try for the first time. We're going to discover a lot of cool stuff together, and I'm so happy you're here. Hello, first timers. I've been wanting to do an episode on starting a business for a while. And when I was thinking of people to reach out to for this episode, today's guest was at the top of my list. Today, I'm talking with Laura Lemon, entrepreneur, clean beauty guru, and owner of one of my favorite shops in Nashville, Lemon Lane. I basically live at this place. (laughs) In this episode, we talk about some of the basics of starting a business, taking chances, and most importantly, listening to your gut. I'm so grateful Laura made time to talk with me because she gave birth to her baby boy less than a week after our interview. I hope all of you current and future entrepreneurs enjoy first time starting a business. So today we have Laura Lemon of Lemon Lane on the podcast. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm so excited to have you on. Me too. I'm happy to be here. Yes. Well, yeah. So uh, one of the topics I was thinking of when I was thinking of this podcast was like first time starting a business. And I, of course, thought of you because Lemon Lane is one of my favorite shops in all of Nashville. And I just took myself on a mini shopping spree a few weeks ago. (laughs) I love you for it. And you've been one of our customers since the beginning. So I I am nothing but loyal when it comes to like beauty products. So yeah. But yeah, so I thought a lot of people could uh, learn from your experience, like opening Lemon Lane. Um, So I thought we could start out with talking about how you got your start in the beauty industry in the first place. Yeah, I mean, goodness. So some would say it maybe started when my grandmother would take me to the clinic counters and she had a whole basket of like all the free gifts she would get. And that was like my first foray into beauty. Um, but really, I mean, I unfortunately had really terrible skin as a teenager, um, mm-hmm. cystic acne to the point where the dermatologist was like, I don't know what we can do to help you. Just don't look in the mirror. That was Same. literally said to me. <laughs> um, Same. I was like, cool. Uh, so I learned, I was a self-taught makeup artist because that was really the only thing that gave me confidence because I had mm-hmm. all these you know, bumps on my face and makeup covered it up and at least helped a little bit, helped me feel better um, just mentally and emotionally. And I just became obsessed with that overall feeling and how makeup can, you know, give women some confidence um, when maybe they're not born with perfect skin. And uh, it really landed my first job um, at Saks Fifth Avenue of all places. I don't even know. I, I went to the interview in my basketball <laughs> jersey. <laughs> I had a, um, I had a practice that day and I could only come in right after. I I don't know what I was thinking, but somehow they gave me the job and I worked at the Laura Mercier counter and I just loved the clienteling aspect. You know, women would come up, you know, a lot of women makeup's really intimidating and they don't know where to start. And so just kind of bridging that gap and making it fun and playful and, you know, having them feel a little better from when they arrived and when they left. Yeah. Uh, and so that's really where the bug bit me. Um, and that continued through college. And I would do like friends makeup for events and weddings and things like that to make some extra money. Um, and, you know, I graduated in 08, which was not um, awesome time to graduate, much like probably right now for some graduates. Mm-hmm. But um, I was kind of struggling with, you know, I could go the makeup artist route and just realizing that that um, isn't, it's, it's hard. It's, you're traveling a lot. You're working yeah. on weekends. You're, you know, the pay isn't awesome. Um, or I could go kind of the business route, um, which I got a degree in marketing. And so I had this, um, 
crazy opportunity to intern at Walmart all, of all places. So I went from Saks Fifth Avenue to Walmart. <laughs> that must and, have been an interesting, yeah. like just um, cultural shift with product. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, and just the customer, everything. Yeah. But I mean, that's what's so cool about retail. I mean, it's never dull. You're constantly learning um, from the customer that walks in the door. But I was at the headquarters in Bentonville and on the beauty buying team and um, really opened my eyes of, and of all places, never would have thought this, but opened my eyes to sustainability and what the natural um, industry was doing in beauty at the time. And they were wanting, they were really interested in like expanding into trying it as a test um, into their beauty segment. And so a test for Walmart is 2000 stores. And so that was literally my first job out of college was to launch natural beauty products into Walmart into 2000. Oh, cool. uh, so I got to meet like Bert of Bert's Bees himself, you know, Alba, Avalon, all kind of those old school natural brands. Yeah. And just that was the veil, you know, as I kind of started into beauty and that segue landed me into more of the natural world was that veil lifted. I started asking more questions. Um, I also had some digestive health issues going on. So I was really into the clean food movement. And that kind of, as you, you know, peel back the onion, you start asking more questions. And I was like, well, man, I'm you know, putting all these products on my skin, I'm not even questioning that, but I'm questioning what's going internally. Mm. You know that it, you know, your skin absorbs what you put on your, on top. So yeah, long story short, you know, I, you just can't unlearn information. And so that's where I was like, okay, if I want to stay in the beauty industry, I need, I really want to go full bore into that direction of the natural and clean beauty space. That point about you can't unlearn things. I, one of my first jobs in New York, when I lived in New York was at Kiehl's and mm -hmm their education program is like very comprehensive. Like you have to go through like a month of training, like before they even let you on the floor. And then you have like a certain color coat you wear for a while until you test up to like a certain oh, knowledge to get yeah, wow. coat and stuff. And um, yeah, just the amount of information I learned about like skincare, skin health, like what goes through and like into your skin. Yeah, it, it kind of set me up for thinking about all of these things in terms of like just the health of, yeah, what you're putting on, on your body is just yeah. as important as what you're putting inside your body too. Right. So, and yeah. how you're using your dollar to support something that you can appreciate or not, you know, like whether that's not even considering what you're putting on your own skin, but it's like, who's making it, who's behind, who's growing mm -hmm. the plants and behind that. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I'm glad it's amazing to see since that was in 2008 and now fast forward Gosh, I'm dating myself. I don't. I can't do math, especially being really pregnant. <laughs> right, like 14 years. <laughs> yeah, that's. Yeah. Um, and seeing where it is today, and now there's so many brands and so many customers that are already there, and they're you know they've done their research and really care. So totally. I mean, it's such a different experience walking into Lemon Lane versus like when I first. I probably got into it around the same time, like 2008. Oh, started cool. thinking about like. Um, clean beauty around that time because I was also diagnosed with a thyroid condition around that time too yeah. and um and so it was like yeah at the time you would go into the grocery store or something and maybe it was yeah Alba or Burt's Bees and those oh, were your and makeup was terrible it was like chalk hockey so <laughs> like nothing would blend yeah. or stay either um it, it would just melt off your face and now it's like it feels like a relief walking into a store like yours because you're like, okay, this is the quality of the stuff that I've been looking for this whole time, but a clean version of it. Exactly, you know? yeah. Um, and I love, I mean, I want people to be like, this is an amazing beauty store. Oh, and it happens to be natural and clean for me too. You know, exactly. like that's how the experience should feel. And it does 100% for sure. So great job at doing that. <laughs> um, what gave you the... I mean, I guess it sounds like the idea for Lemon Lane was maybe like percolating um, behind yeah, this. Yeah. So it kind of made you take the leap to decide, you know what, I'm going to open my own place. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, it's a lot of things. I think I, I have entrepreneurial blood in me. Both my grandfathers started their own businesses and worked up until the day they passed away. Um, so it's always, and my, actually my, my mom and stepdad also had their own business. So I've always been at the front row seat of seeing what that's like. Um, so I always kind of felt that itch. Um, but I also was smart enough to know like, okay, I need to really like know what that is before I 
go jump in. Mm. So I, I, you know, I tried to be a sponge and after my time in Arkansas at Walmart, I went out to San Francisco where the clean movement was really happening and just did a lot of different jobs doing sales and marketing and doing um, product development, um, even studied holistic nutrition out there. Whoa. And so um, that was kind of, I was like, okay, I really want to just learn as much as I can at this moment in time, because I know this is such a great experience that I might not have forever. Um, and just realizing, you know, working at different startups, you know, you, you see behind the scenes and you realize that like, no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> Like, yeah, <laughs> no one. They want to pretend, and you fake it till you make it. And just realizing, like, man, if that person that literally had no beauty experience started this company, and just had the initiative and gusto and got it done, and you, you know, you, you're witnessing that, then it's like, well, why couldn't I? You know, I just kind of felt that itch, and I started thinking about you know some of my favorite jobs that I've had, and it really was always retail. I was not. Um, at the time, I was doing more behind the scenes, like a lot of analytics on the computer, which was great learning, but not where I wanted to be, you know, 10 years later. And I just miss interacting with the customers and that special, like, a feeling you get, you know, you're as a retailer or buyer, you're um, listening to customers and that's important, but you're also trying to stay one step ahead of the customer. Yeah. So that sweet spot is just what I loved and creating like an atmosphere and experience that people can physically be in. And I think, you know, I, I'm I'm a millennial. You may be as well. I am, yeah. And um, You're millennial, just, technically. <laughs> like the I know. I think I'm like a two two years off from Gen X, you right? Know, but depending on who you ask. But um, you know, and being out in the Bay Area where there's so much tech, so much everything's online. I think I was just seeing like, oh my god, I don't want that. I, I want that human connection. Yeah. So all those kind of things were in the back of my head, and my husband and I. Um, we're thinking about moving back closer to where we grew up. I grew up in Oklahoma. He grew up in Alabama and Nashville was at the top of the list and really moving back here where the cost of living is lower. Um, the barriers to entry to start a new business are lower than, you know, downtown San Francisco um, just gave me the opportunity and the time to be like, okay, well, if I'm going to do it, like I got to do it now and just yeah. went for it. <laughs> I love that. And I, yeah, it is kind of one of those things that um, I love what you're saying earlier about like, well, if these people can do it and they don't have any experience, like why not yes. me? And I think yeah. that's like a big barrier. A lot of people get stuck on is thinking right. like maybe they're not like deserving. Imposter syndrome. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Especially women, right? It's like, we always want to know as much as we can before we pull the trigger on something. And I think it's like learning to just start before you're a professional. That's the hardest part is just putting the first step. I mean, that is the hardest part of any business. It's like taking that leap. And, and yeah, I struggled with that too. I mean, I always felt like, oh, I'm not an esthetician. I'm not you know, a professional makeup artist, like who's going to listen to me? Who's going to care what my perspective is? You know, there's always that in the back of your head. Um, but I also just had this, feel, like, I didn't want to work for anyone else. I think that yeah. was a big motivator too. I was like, I am not, I'm, I'm better at being a boss, you know? So, okay. um, that, yeah, that helped me get over that. <laughs> I feel that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> It sounds like the move to Nashville was more based on like quality of life things that you were mm -hmm. looking for. Um, had you looked into the market at all here to think like this would be a good place to launch something like this? It seems like there's a need. Um, and then subsequently Houston, Houston right, is the other right. location. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, yeah, you would think I would have done more than that. Um, <laughs> I, you know, at the time I, I did know for a fact that the, the, this was 2016 when we moved. And at the time the, the coastal cities were getting it, the, that's where everything was happening. The stores were coming up, the brands were popping up, but I knew growing up in Oklahoma that there, there was not really a lot of that going on, but there was a shift happening. Cause when I would visit my family, you know, there's farmer's markets now there's yoga studios. There's things that like, I did not have access to growing up in yeah. the middle of Oklahoma. Um, and so seeing that, I was like, there's something happening here that, you know, we're, the investors, private equity, that land is not focused on is in the middle of the country. So knowing that Nashville was very buzzy and a lot of people are moving from the coast to there like us, um, I was like, okay, well, if I love and know this world, like I'm sure there's a customer here. 
Um, and, but it was really hard. I mean, I think with brick and mortar, the most important thing is location, location, location. And so I opened our first store within six months moving here. So I really didn't know the city that much. And I even re pulled out the offer on this place that we're currently in because I got scared. <laughs> then I came back to them. I was like, just kidding. So, <laughs> you know, that was a little bit of a that was a, probably a bigger gamble financially too, because you're yeah. you're signing up for a long term lease. That's How long is the of, lease on on a, a place like that? Well, typically you see anywhere from five to ten years, and okay. you might have like a five year option with two three year renewals. Um, so that's part of the negotiation. It kind of just depends, and it depends. Like restaurants, maybe will have a longer lease. I could talk to you hours. About this. <laughs> it's boring but fascinating too. Um, but yeah, so I, I got, I think I got lucky. I think a, a lot of times it's luck. We hit the ground running and had an amazing, um, timing with like, like I said, the right people were moving here that wanted these products that, that weren't currently being sold anywhere in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Um, and just the amount of younger women moving here too. Uh, so that helped. And then, you know, that success helped us launch a second store, um, which we've had a lot of learnings for that. I think, you know, always go with your gut. That's like the biggest takeaway ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it is, it's always right. It's just a matter of you, if you can listen to her or not. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think I was coming from the Bay Area. You have this pressure to grow, like startups, you grow, grow, grow. I, I thought I wanted to have 10 stores and then another 10 and, you know, just it become like a bigger operation. Um and so I was, I was really amped to grow. I thought that's what I needed to do. And I think we grew a little too fast. It's been good. That customer is actually a lot like Nashville's customer, very engaged, very community driven. Um, we're in a really cool area, um, but it's hard to, you know, as a small business to operate that far away. Yeah. Um, and like Nashville, Houston, um, one of the reasons why we chose that market is because a lot of my top performing brands had no representation in Houston, or if they did, it was one store and Houston is mm -hmm. the fourth largest market in the country. Wow. So it's, um, it was such to me, like my business hat was like, okay, that's a huge opportunity, yeah, but there's that. also a lot of other things that, you know, hindsight's 2020, um, sure. that you have to kind of factor in as well. So. Sure. And like when you're staffing a store like that, that far away, like how do you go about looking for the right people to kind of manage it and work it? Because the staff at your store is so knowledgeable. They're so involved. Like it doesn't feel like you're just walking in. They're like, let me ring you up. It's like, right. what are you looking for? I know exactly based on what you've told me, these products do this and kind of vetting people. Do you do you use um, platforms like LinkedIn to find people? Or yes, we've people? had some success there. Um, most of our team, our customers first, frankly, cool. I think that's the best because they know that feeling like what you're talking about. And they're like, okay, wow, this is different. This is like something I want to be a part of. And um, we've had the most success with that. And we ha really haven't had, knock on wood, <laughs> we haven't had too much attrition or, or problem finding people because um, it is beauty. I mean, it's fun, right? It's a fun yeah. job. Um, and, uh, I would, I mean, I, it's, I think it's the most important part and the hardest part of my job though, not only, um, finding the right people, but keeping the right people, keeping them motivated, keeping mm. them interested and training is huge. I mean, we have over 600 products in the store and my expectation is that they know at least a little bit about all of them yeah. um, and be able to speak to it and so training is paramount we actually have a whole internal program kind of like keels we don't wear you know color coded <laughs> but um you know i think that's where we really stand out and we want it to feel approachable like playful and fun but we also know our stuff if you come yeah. in like we can we can speak to it that's true for anyone listening. It's 100% true. Like I have never had a question not answered there. Um, well, yeah, some people, I mean, we get, we get some hard questions, but it's always like, we'll fight, we'll figure it out. You know? We'll yeah. Fight. Women's health is extremely important to me, and I think modern fertility is one of the most exciting, accessible new advancements to come out in recent years to help us really understand our bodies more. Whether you're ready to pop out a mini me like yesterday or the thought of being someone's parent after the night you had last night seems light years away, knowledge is power. 
Understanding how our bodies work to better be able to prepare for the future and take better care of ourselves right now is game-changing. Modern Fertility doesn't just offer fertility testing. It also offers birth control, prenatal vitamins, ovulation and pregnancy tests, and just launched a sperm kit because fertility isn't just a woman's job, okay? So click the link in the show notes for $10 off your Modern Fertility hormone test and join the thousands of women who refuse to let fertility be a mystery. Now, back to the show. Totally. And um, so you ended up doing a an online component like a few a few years later. Yeah. What felt like it was the right time to do that um, with the club Lemon Lane? Or is are those like, do you have to be part of the club to shop online? Yes. Or? So okay. It is a little unique business model in that way. Um, I so like for a small business, you have limited resources, right? And so when starting off, everyone was like, of course, you're gonna have an online store, you know, like everyone that's a brick and mortar has an online component. That's just the way of the commerce world, mm-hmm. um, which makes a lot of sense. You know, it's, it's low hanging fruit. It's able to capture a sale um, from someone that doesn't live in those markets or can't come in. Mm-hmm. But um, to do it well, I was like, I need time and money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I don't like to do had things half assed. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it like the right way and our own way and have our own perspective. And so we held off doing it, knowing that like we were going to, at some point, we knew we needed to have an online presence, but it really, what was great is we were able to really understand after waiting three years, um, what our value was to our customer, you know, what do we offer that other people can't. And when you look at the landscape, even from when we started to now, it's really changed. You have, you know, I'm in some ways competing for market share with the brands directly. If Tata Harper runs a sale and you love Tata Harper, you're going to go to them directly because they have a better sale than what what we're having. Um, And then also if you factor in Instagrams, (laughs) all that stuff with influencers are becoming mini retailers in themselves. So for me, I felt like looking back on like, okay, why is someone coming into our store? And I think um, or I know that a good portion is because we take the time to get to know them personally and get to know their needs and what they want. And we recommend based on that. And so being able to m- mirror that experience online was like, to me, the coolest opportunity because so much of online is so transactional. It's just click to cart buy. maybe you see an influencer. It's like, I love this cream for myself. You buy it, you get it. You're like, well, that didn't really work for me. Right. Cause yeah. it's like, we're totally different skin. Um, so really the part of the club that's so unique is every member has the opportunity for us to really sit down and give them a consultation, go through their needs, recommend an entire routine if they want, or one or two products you get, um, 5% back to as a perk on any purchases. And, um, you, you know, you just, you feel taken care of, you feel it's true clientele, which is how retail use, you know, departments, yeah. um, I'll never, you know, I think it's. Louis Vuitton or some like really luxury based brand, um, their flagship store literally has handwritten notes of every customer tucked away and this filing system in the back. And so they can know anytime someone comes in. I just love that like tactile um, service that people get. Totally. Like, yeah, very old school. That uh, just reminded me when I was at Kiehl's, like I worked at the flagship store, which like started basically as an apothecary in like early 1900s. And they also have like a very comprehensive like client system. So you would do the same thing, but you know, on computers at that point. So like taking notes on like purchases that people buy and like all these things. And um, I was, I was always impressed with that element. I don't know if that's still the case there. It's been so long since I've been but it is so rare to find that because it does feel so transactional nowadays. Um, it's like there are a lot of times you walk to a store and no one even talks to you, you know? Yes. Yeah. And, and we, and frankly, we probably are missing out on some sales, you know, but for me, it was like, I want to have a long-term view of this, not just like quick grab sales because, yeah. at the end. Um, because at the end of the day, if, if you have a website that's white background that you're constant scrolling through product, 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 you just become like everyone else and Amazon's going to eat you for lunch at the end of the day. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, uh, what is something that you 
know now that you didn't expect when you first thought about starting your business? Oh my gosh, so many things. Um, <laughs> the importance of saying no. Mm. I think you're so eager to say yes, yes, yes to things um, because you're starting out, you know, but it, it's, and I, when I say no, I mean, no, with a purpose, like you have a vision of what you're wanting yeah. and you don't go away from that vision. Even if yeah, you might, yeah. it might be monetarily successful, you know, but you just have to like stay in that pocket, have your blinders on. Um, another thing is don't compare, you know, yourself like that's, Ooh. that's the thief of joy. Truly. Yes. So just like stay in your lane, stay focused. It was a huge thing for me. Um, I also just like the things that you think, like the thing, the thing that I loved about retail, you know, was being in the shop and, and um, spending that time. And I naively thinking maybe that's what I was going to be doing as business owner majority of the time, but <laughs> as the business grew, like realizing, wow, that's, I'm not doing that hardly at all now. And I'm having to do focus on other things that, you know, you, you need to prioritize. Um, mm -hmm. so just having to sometimes do parts of the job that you're maybe not even as good at or, um, excited to buy because the business needs it and just kind of rolling with that and just knowing that it's all part of the experience. Yeah, I feel like all of that is also so applicable to music as well. Like that, that was my career in music is exactly all of that. Like, don't compare yourself, know when to say no. Uh, you're going to end up doing a lot of admin work. And you're going to hustle. Doing yeah. like booking tours, like doing PR, like all, of, you know, distribution, all of these different things that you just... Yeah. When you're thinking about becoming a musician, you're like, I'm just gonna write songs and play and them sing all the time. <laughs> you know, very I cute. Mean, hopefully, that's the goal, and you get there one day, but definitely not at the beginning, right? No, and even still, it's like uh, there's always new things to adapt to, and new things that you have to learn how to do that you're not as passionate about, no matter what level of your career that you're in. And so it's like kind of making peace, right? Like with those things, and it's like, okay, now I have to work on like how much stock do we have? How much? How many things do I need to order? Or like, you know, um, and I think at least you're an entrepreneur or musician, really. It's like you kind of have to be comfortable being a jack of all trades and yeah. just because you don't know how to do something like be resourceful figure it out i mean that would be one of my bigger pieces of advice because if it's not you then you're paying someone else to do that and then your business isn't as profitable yes for sure what is one of your favorite things that you've discovered about owning a business since you've started this the our customers and our team frankly i mean especially coming out of covid like um it just put everything in perspective for me. I mean, we would not be around if it wasn't for our team showing up and in a time that was very um, volatile mm -hmm. and also our customers being loyal. And like we, become, the timing of this, I mean, we had started the process of getting an online shop. And so, but we weren't going to rush it just to get it done within a month when we had these big grand plans, you know, that was going to take a while to do it right. So we had about six months of from the start of COVID to when we launched our website that we were asking our customers to text us to place orders. Wow. It was the only way that we were making money from for six months. And they did it, you know, like I was like, I thought for sure I was like, we're done, we're over with, <laughs> you know. Um, so that was incredible just to watch our customers stick with us and our team. And so I think as I'm going forward, it's it's just a good feeling to know like you know, it's not, it's, I feel like there's so much um, sexiness with startups and starting your own business. And, you, you know, like I said before, like in Bay Area, it's all about growing. And mm -hmm. I'm like, actually, no, like, I just want to have, I want to enjoy my time yeah. with our customers and with our team and make the best of that. And that to me is more of like my definition of success than just growing. Yeah, that's so... That, that's such a good point. It's, it's about, yeah, the quality of your time, right? How you're mm -hmm. spending your time. And if you're, okay, great. So you maybe you have this like uh, multi-million dollar business, but if you're completely miserable running it, then what was the point yeah. of starting? Right, you're just life? killing yourself. Yeah. 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 yeah totally. It was a reset in a lot of ways. 
Mm. Last thing, any last words of advice to would-be entrepreneurs, business owners? Yeah, I love these questions. Um, I need to like... I'm sure there's so like, much, you know, it's like there's so yeah. many... Yeah, it's like it's so hard because, I mean, you just kind of have to do it. And like I said before, no one knows what they're doing. That's yeah. <laughs> um, So take my advice with a grain of salt. But I... um. I think leaning in to your network um, and fostering that network as like, let's say you're in a job that you just can't stand. We've all been there. Mm -hmm. Like this is not for me. Like thinking that as an opportunity to learn other roles in that company or befriend the whoever, I don't know, someone that's a different skill set that you don't know. And because when you start a company, you're going to need to lean on those people and ask for favors, frankly. And and what I found is most people really want to help you. I mean, we're all Americans. Like we love that idea of like pull yourself up from your bootstraps and like you're doing it. People want to like cheer you on and don't be afraid to ask for help and, and do that because people um, want to lend their advice. Like, yeah, don't overdo it and, you know, take up all their time and, and all that. But, you know, like whether it's um, advice on real estate or a lawyer friend that can help, you know, look over a, a quick document for you or, um, you know, someone that's in PR that like knows that world that you can pick their brain for. And then, you know, when you open your doors, give them a discount or give them some free product or, mm -hmm. you know, always pay, pay it forward. But, um, that was really important. I wish I would have focused on that more. I tend to be kind of one that just like, I get things done myself. I don't like to rely on other people. Yeah. And I, I think I, because of that wasted some time and money at the early onset that I maybe could have just been a little more resourceful. Sure. Actually, that just made me think of one other question too. Like, um, is there anything that you spent money on that you were like, oh, I would never do that again? Because I know there's definitely been things in my career in music that I'm like, I will never pay for PR again because it's so hit or miss. <laughs> like, we'll never do it. Like, you pry it out of my cold dead hands. Oh. <laughs> So I say this with a grain of salt. I'm kind of the same way. I do all my own marketing newsletters, social. It's all internal. I We've paid for that in the past and it's just not the same. It's something that I deeply care about too. So I'm like, no one's ever going to do it like I am. Totally. Um, but I say that with a caveat because there's things, you know, get creative. Like one of the biggest learnings too after COVID was work with people that have skin in the game with you. Mm -hmm. So if we, we were building out this website, we had our developers have without getting too technical and how our deal worked they would they had the opportunity to make more money depending on the success of how the website did wow so they're incentivized to work hard care get back to you on time really hear you know your mission and your what you're wanting to do and care hmm. um, and finding those people that are willing to do that are key so we try to do that with a lot of things now whether that's marketing whether that's you know looking at real estate and potentially buying a building and you know like mm -hmm. things like that that um are really big projects but it's like how do we get someone to really care you know like because we're we're not that big and we want to incentivize them like hey if you do care and this works out you get you can win with us yeah um, and I think that's really a good lesson for us as there's been multiple times where you pace a, a professional and what you get is like wow I could have saved a couple grand and done this myself, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and, and you guys are so good at fostering that sense of community with the kind of events that you host. And I'm sure I, I can totally see that transferring into building equanimity with bringing people into building the website and employees. Right. And, so and that, even our team, yeah. um, during COVID, we launched a profit share program for our team. Wow. And so they, and I haven't invested, um, you know, reason to care too, you know, yeah. and, you know, people want to, at the end of the day, people will work to get paid, you know, it is a job. So you have to kind of, as a small business, get creative with how you um, do that and how you keep people invested. Well, I am so happy we were able to connect this on this. It so fast. I love it. I know. It just like flew by. You had so much good information. Just like, just, you know, give to us, lay it on us. Um, but I'm so happy that you guys are here. I'm so uh, happy to see business owners like you just, you know, going for it. And I hope that 
the advice you had to share today inspires more people who have the same kind of heart you have for like community and um, equanimity to just really start their own businesses and just, you know, yeah, really. We need, yeah, we need more yeah. of those people around for sure. And, um, and more customers like you too, that really care about the community and are supporting small businesses. So I really thank you. Oh my gosh, it's my pleasure. Thank, again, like thank you for creating something I wanna be a part of. Thank you so much for hanging out with Laura and me today. If you're in the process of starting a business, I hope you got some tangible advice you can apply to the process. And if you're thinking about starting a business and it's just a little tiny spark in your brain right now, I hope this conversation inspires you to explore that idea some more and maybe even take your first steps towards making it a reality. If you'd like to keep up with Laura, you can follow her on Instagram at Laura M. Lemon. And if you want to join Club Lemon Lane or visit the stores in Nashville or Houston, you can get more info on Instagram at lemon underscore lane and lane is L-A-I-N-E. And if you'd like to follow me on Instagram, you can do that at Danny Official and that's D-A-A-N-I Official. Please, 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 please spread the word to your friends and family and subscribe to the show. Leave us a review of the things if you're enjoying it as it really helps a ton in new listeners being able to find us. First Time for Everything is produced by Two Sheilas Productions and our theme song, Closer, is performed by me, written by me and my friends, The Royal Foundry, and produced by The Royal Foundry. Thank you so much for listening and remember, it's never too late for your first time. First Time for Everything.